thank you for the nice welcome and, and thank you all for coming out and uh, thanks to the great crew who put this all together. Um, as I said, I'm Joel Workin. I'm a professor here at Missouri S&T and I'm going to take you through a little bit of a, a story of some of the work we've done and ideas we've had and make you think about maybe a different way of utilizing plants and engineering with plants uh, that we've come up with. And I want to bring two ideas together mostly today. And those ideas, first of all, is public health. What is human health like? How does it relate to the world around us? And then I want to link it to plants. And I want to bring a, a, maybe a new approach, a new thought process for you all to think of plants and how the, they interact with uh, human health. And I'm going to bring those two together and maybe have a new concept uh, of how these two are linked going forward. Um, and the first idea is human health, essentially, is driven by our exposome. It's a, kind of a little bit of a new concept. Um, this is a figure from National Institutes of Health. And think about your disease burden, your disease load, is driven by what's around you. Exposure to chemicals in the air we breathe. Exposure to microbes in the water we drink. Exposure to chemicals in the water we drink. Compounds in our food, microbes in our food. Disease that we may touch from people around us or objects around us. So all of that is our burden, our exposome, as we would. And that's really driven by the surroundings, the vectors around us. Air carries those to us. Water that we drink brings it to us. And maybe a little bit more obvious and probably the first real understanding of disease from our environment or from our surroundings uh, many, many uh, decades ago. Um, contact. Things we contact, people, doorknobs, dirt, our building that we live in, all can carry uh, exposures that lead to a disease load. And then the soil and food, soil that blows in the air and that we inhale or ingest, and also how the uh, chemicals from that soil may transfer into our food. So that comprises most of our, again, exposome, how we're exposed to chemicals and disease burden. And I'm an environmental engineer. My job in, in, in training other students is to prevent disease in human. That's it. That's pretty much it. We want to mitigate the contact, the vectors that we have with our exposome so that we have a healthier population. That, that's my job. So that's where it comes from on that side. And really, it, it's the surroundings of our entire environment. We may not think of some of these, but if we have chemicals that are released into our water or soil nearby, we probably don't know that. So how, how can we mitigate and deal with something that we, we really can't see, we can't feel, we can't smell, but yet that's what's causing a burden to, to human health. And some of these come in ways that we would never expect. You know, particles that maybe blow from a contaminated site, or a petroleum spill from a neighboring gasoline station that, that flows underneath our house unsuspectingly, and then the vapors come up into our home while we're asleep, while we breathe. So that's a, a new concept, kind of. And, and think about this, if this is your home, and there's chemicals around it, we would never know. And there's a term called vapor intrusion, it's been well known for decades, that homes are actually a little bit of a negative pressure. As we heat our homes and as wind blows by, it actually pulls some of the gases up from the subsurface, and it may contain organic molecules or chemicals from nearby, that again, we didn't know was there, or radon, that's completely natural, but again, gets pulled into our homes, and that's the exposure we have. And now we, we, on average, spend about 22 hours a day in our homes or in our workplace, but indoors. So that indoor exposure is a big component of it. And the air we breathe, we actually breathe about 10 times the mass of air versus the water we drink. But we don't think about that as carrying things to us. So we come up with a, a kind of a new concept, and it's re related to plants. So now I want to make you rethink plants. I think I got the, the human health aspects there a little bit. But what is that that you see on the screen? A seed, yeah, an unsuspecting seed. What is that seed going to become? A redwood. A redwood, very good. <laughs> it's going to become the biggest and the oldest organism on our planet. Maybe that individual seed would become the very individual within that. That was uh, very close to redwood here. Um, it's a giant sequoia. And this, this actual tree is the uh, General Sherman tree in California, and it is the biggest single-stemmed organism on our planet. It's estimated to be 2,400 to about 2,700 years old, and it weighs in at almost 2,000 tons. That's almost 4 million pounds. How did it get that big? 
it collected. It collected carbon dioxide from the surrounding air. It collected water and nutrients from the subsurface. But it never moved. It, it didn't go out and hunt. It didn't go get more biomass. It assimilated it from its surroundings. And in doing so, we kind of thought about it a little bit differently. But think about that. So the plant is place-bound. It's in one location, and it's a collector of all kinds of things. But I will say, this may be a little bit more impressive in some ways, that this is considered to be the oldest overall organism on our planet. This is Pando. It's the over 100-acre aspen stand. And an aspen stand is all connected by the roots. So this is really one organism that you see there. And it's estimated to be about 80,000 years old that there's been uh, this plant there overall. And it's estimated over 6,000 tons of biomass. But again, I thought the, the gigantic redwood or uh, sequoia was a little more impressive there. But plants are also amazing. They survive everywhere. Almost every corner of our planet that has anything that resembles soil and gets sunlight and has even any water, plants have survived there. The one you see on your left is the resurrection fern. It can go for decades without water. And within 24 hours of getting a rainfall, it turns into an entirely vegetative plant and starts the reproductive process. They estimate that it can go up to 100 years without water. That's amazing. And the other two live, they're the southernmost uh, flowering plants in the world, and they live uh, near Antarctica, on the islands around it and on some of the coasts. And they only see sun a few months of the year, and the temperatures are well below freezing, but yet in that little glimmer of having life, they reproduce and, and form a new generation every year. And plants are also amazing. Even in places where they don't have nutrients to grow, they figured out a way to harvest nutrients from the organisms around it. So these are the picture plant on the left, which we have here in Missouri, and the Venus flytrap on the right. And both of those will harvest insects and utilize the nutrients in them, and they can grow in nutrient-deprived conditions as their selective advantage. So plants do a lot of things. And they're also amazing in another way. They sense. So you see these seeds and they start to grow. That root is sensing gravity. It's following down. It wants to find water. Water goes down. It's sensing the water content. It's sensing the oxygen content. It's sensing how much nutrient is in the soil around it, and it will adapt its growth pattern to find every ounce of life, giving things it can. The leaves, the cotyledons, come up from the, sun, from the underneath, and they grow towards the light. They're, they're hungry for light. They'll go for it. If it's underneath a, a stone or something, you'll see those cotyledons grow really fast out the side, and then once they get the light, they shoot up. They know which direction to go. We thought plants could sense something a little bit more, and that led to the concept of phytoforensics. So think again now about those pollutants, we're going to bring them together. So if we have a pollution existence near us, and it's underground, we can't see it, we can't see it, we can't feel it, sense it, but the plants do. So as that pollutant spreads out, and takes up a bigger environmental space or volume, it comes into contact with those plant roots. And the plant roots, that's a, a plant root membrane that essentially is the, the disconnect between the outside world and the living world. Some of the pollutants make it through that, and then they're pulled up. Sun and wind drive the evapotranspiration process, and this can move water from the subsurface up through the plant to the atmosphere, and as it moves up the plant, it actually carries some of those pollutant molecules with it. So our concept was then, let's go above ground, grab a little piece of that plant, and it's got some groundwater in it. So it can tell us what the roots were contacting days, months, weeks before. And again, the plant never moved. It's been there sensing, doing this for us, if we want to gather that information, its whole life. And it's a tremendous contact with the subsurface. Those roots, again, have spread out to harvest all they need, and for us, they're pulling up a few pollutant molecules so we can understand our, our world a little better. And it's very straightforward, really. Uh, we take a, an increment bore up here, and we put it in the tree, and we can pull out about the size of a pencil. It's only a couple centimeters long. And we put that in a little chemical vial where we contain it, bring it back to the laboratory, and do chemical analysis on the water that was in it. And what we've done then is we've got a picture of below ground wherever that plant was, and we can look at a chemical signature for the pollutants and other things that are in that, that water. And we've used this at a number of sites. Um, you can see one here. This is actually New Haven, Missouri, not far from here. Um, and they lost their city water supply to a pollutant called perchloroethylene. It's a very common pollutant, one of the most common we have globally. Uh, it was widely used. It's cheap. We spilled a lot of it. 
But we wanted to figure out where it was. So you can see the dots on that are all individual trees where we took a little piece of the tree, put it in a vial, drove it back to Rala, and analyzed it. We did all of these sites in about a day, pulling them all back, and you can see there's a pattern there. There's a contaminated area, and it moves actually up towards the Missouri River. And to confirm it, we went in and put in monitoring wells to actually sample that groundwater. And if you look up, they match up almost perfectly. The first one on your left took us about an afternoon, you know, a couple hundred dollars worth of equipment, thousand dollars worth of chemical analysis, and we had the data in a couple days. The one on the right takes a ginormous drill rig to come into people's yards, drill a hole in the ground, get a little bit of water out, come back the next day, drill a new hole, get a little more water out. And overall, great savings and much faster, much easier, and much less invasive to the homes that are around there. So you can see where they match up. That's the tree pattern shown in red, and it hits all of the contaminated wells. We've actually done this on about 85 sites in eight countries and 13 states so far. So we've done uh, quite a bit of this, and, and I like to feel like we've prevented people from being exposed to chemicals that they would have been otherwise. So our plants are also like our homes. As those plants are there, and they're harvesting from that subsurface, they do about the same thing as our home. They provide a, a driving force, a gradient of energy, pulling those molecules in, just the way our home pulled those molecules in. So if we understand and we think about how plants interact with their environment, that's an indication of what we may be exposed to right next door in our home by sampling the tree in the front yard very simply and easily. So here's a, a little bit more on the sampling concept. We can drill a, a deep well, and we can get multiple levels of chemical analysis, but again, at great expense and over a large area. Or we can go to the soil and take a very small sample, sampling literally cubic centimeters of space in our environment, very small subsample, well, if we compare that to our home. We can go inside of our home and sample below our basement floor, again invasive, takes quite a bit of time, and you have to enter somebody's home and say, you may be exposed to chemicals, you may not. We don't know, but we're going to find out. So you, you, you open that confidence question. Indoor air, we can sample the air around us, but if somebody used airplane glue days before or other different solvents that carry some of these same chemicals, we may get a, an artificial signal that says, you have these chemicals in your home, when it's really just you brought your dry cleaning home a few days ago. And that drags in a few of these molecules as well. Or we can go out here where the tree is, and we sample the same volume. The tree's been there, in some cases, longer than the home. And it's sampling the same space. Soil, vapor, water, all in a composite. And it's free. The sample is there. We just have to go up and take a little piece of the tree. So we come up with a fast, cheap, accurate, spatially, non-destructive, non-invasive way to get a surrogate sample of your home. And when we do this places, people don't even know we were there. Walk up 10 minutes. If it's in the right of way, we can do it from the city street. And we can walk away with that sample and get the analysis in a couple days. So we're pretty happy with that, and it works pretty well. And by the way, we use plants for phytoremediation to actually on purpose remove chemicals from our environment around us as well. But phytoforensics plants as a sampler was basically uh, generated as an idea here at Missouri s &T. But we have to understand which chemicals get in and which don't. So some chemicals will not get through. But what does that mean? What, what other understanding could we be? We think of plants differently now, I hope. Okay, it's, it's an organic membrane separating the outside world from a vascular tissue of a living organism. What else does that sound like? That's us. Our membranes, our skin, our lungs, our blood system, our intestines, our stomach, they're the membranes between the outside world and us as life. And when we look at that, the structure of those membranes is actually very well conserved, very consistent across many different types of organisms, plants, animals, everything else. They're the same that's inside of our bodies, largely. Not exactly, of course, but they mimic those membranes quite a bit. So we can think of plants in human beings or mammalian systems as having similarities. It's a vascular system made up of membranes separating those tissues. And when we really look at it, we can think about that harvesting system about the same way as chemicals entering our body through our exposome and ending up in places throughout our body. So what else? Well, we found out looking at the chemical properties of how drugs are designed 
to get into different components of our body, different compartments, different environmental volumes, if you will, and they mimic those of plants. So we're running through tests to say, can we screen for chemicals? We can predict where they'll go, but then if a chemical is existent as a drug or as a pollutant, can we test it in plants and better understand where it will end up in your body? And it turns out that from our preliminary work, root membranes tend to mimic the blood-brain barrier. So if a chemical moves through these plants readily, guess where it goes in you? So it's kind of a new concept, and I hope you rethink plants a little bit. So now when you look at plants, hopefully you'll, you'll come up with the idea, they're pollution sentinels for us. And we also have examples where we can sample bark or leaf tissue to get what's in the air around us, or even global distribution of chemicals. But they also do much more for us. Plants are very important to us. First of all, all the oxygen on our planet essentially was generated from plants, and all of the water that goes through a plant is purified. It leaves its absolutely pure H2O, and it re-enters the, the hydrologic cycle. So plants can take these polluted waters, or any waters, and release the water back into the, the hydrologic cycle in a pure fashion. Also provides us with all the food. All the food, all the energy we've ever had came through plants. Photosynthesis, pulling in sunlight, combining carbon dioxide with water, making organic carbon for us to live on. Directly, but also indirectly, it makes the soil. The plants die and make the fertile soil for everything else around us. Provisions are also part of that. The wood we use for our homes or for construction, fibers we use, even pigments, even medicines come from plants. They provide us with very, very much that we rely on. In addition, ecology. So plants drive the ecology around them, the ecosystems that evolve based off the plant. If a plant leaves a certain area, anything that, provided, or that it provided for will leave the area as well. And also it provides us comfort and social value. There's a term called biophilia that's uh, developed. And essentially, we love plants. It makes us feel better. We spend a lot of money landscaping our yards, our university, our towns, a lot of money on parks. We spend money because it has great value to us. It makes us feel better. It improves our mental health as well. So overall, plants mean a lot to us. When I thought about the value of plants, the two most expensive plants I could come up with were uh, sunflowers by Van Gogh and poplars by Monet. Um, and, and to me, they actually pale in comparison to the rainbow eucalyptus you see on your left. That's an actual plant. That's not colored or anything else. Maybe a filter on it. I didn't take the picture, but you can see that plants provide very much for us. And with that, I hope I've kind of combined a couple ideas that are very important to us. And I, I want to thank the people that helped make this possible. Uh, some of my graduate students, Matt Limmer, Jordan Wilson, uh, and many others. And John Schumacher is a collaborator who's been very important to me in my career along the way. And I'd also like to thank Terry Barner, who you get to hear from later today, and Tom Shipley for making a lot of the graphics that you saw and putting together those great videos. Uh, and also Gavin Jewell and Joanne Stiritz for a lot of the, the graphics you saw as well. And with that, I just want to say thank you very much to you and to the TEDx staff for making this possible. Thank you.